Major funding for Welcome to the Club was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding was provided by the Pacific Pioneer Fund, the Wellspring Foundation, Artist Trust, and by the following donors. A complete list is available from ITVS. For most of her life, Charlene Arthur was viewed as a renegade. A Texas-born musician, she was a hard-living, feisty, and opinionated woman, musically and physically aggressive on stage and off. She wore men's slacks and cowboy shirts. She leapt from stage amplifiers. She sang while lying down. In short, she caused a stir wherever she went. A big welcome for Miss Charlene Arthur. What about tomorrow? What about tomorrow? Will you still feel the same as today? I was considered an outlaw to a lot of uh, musicians and disc jockeys and that because I wanted to do things my way. <laughs> <laughs> I was nonconformist. They couldn't conform me into, mold me into the little hot dress. I worked uh, harder than Elvis ever thought about. Was Elvis at well, was a little before his time? Absolutely, yeah. man. I was shaking that thing before he ever thought about it. <laughs> you still care. Charlene was a pioneer in a type of music that had yet to be named, but would come to be called rockabilly. Assertive, exhilarating, boisterous music, rockabilly flourished in the mid-1950s and borrowed from gospel, bluegrass, hillbilly boogie, country, and rhythm and blues. Later, it would be known as rock and roll. It would be the men of rockabilly who would become well-known, men like Elvis Presley, Jerry Lee Lewis, Carl Perkins, Johnny Cash, Roy Orbison. But Charlene Arthur predated and later paralleled their efforts. She was a proto-rockabilly performer, hard at work while Elvis was still drafting the concept in his mother's kitchen. Charlene Arthur died never fully realizing her place in music history, but soon other women would come along in her wake and try their hand at this new music. And just like Charlene, they would be pioneers in a world that was not quite ready for them. If you've loved before and you've tried Again, and the world marks you as a long man of sin. And welcome to the club. Come in the beat with me. You don't have to be a man. A broken heart, the only thing. What is rockabilly? Well, it's life to me. <laughs> it's there, and it hits you right in the face when you hear it, and you love it. I guess a hyper kid with a guitar in his hand. You know. It was coming from the soul. It was raw. It was what you felt. Kind of like that. <laughs> Back in the 40s, they had a music that they called hillbilly music. And then you had the black artists that did rhythm and blues. When Elvis and Carl and uh, Jerry Lee and Johnny all got popular, well, they had the new terminology, rockabilly. It was a hillbilly doing rock stuff. I think rockabilly music is a little bit of gospel music, um, a little bit of rhythm and blues. A little bit of country, and a little bit of get down Pentecostal music. You 
can hear all kind of influence in rockabilly music, but it but it all has that one uh, dimension, and it is, is that it's danceable and hand clapping and fun. There's a lot to be said for infusions of boogie woogie and the influence of southern gospel and all this other kind of stuff, but I still think at its root, that's basically what we're talking about: is white kids learning to amp up their music like R&B jump tunes. Rockabilly is a very androgynous form of music, meaning it really is putting together female elements and male elements. Uh, the, the women were able to be a little bit more assertive because of the driving quality of the beat, whereas the men also had longer hair, uh, tended to be able to put a cry in their voice and be very emotional, kind of not very John Wayne-like. The story of rockabilly women really starts with the search for the female pioneers of country music. That quest was undertaken by two writers, Robert Orman and Mary Buffwack. The result was their groundbreaking book, Finding Her Voice. We had become increasingly fascinated with the women of country music, who at that time were Dolly, Tammy, Loretta. I mean, these people that were writing these powerfully emotional things. And we began looking for their predecessors. And in that search, we stumbled on the rockabilly women and thought, what a great untold little story this is. In studying rockabilly women, I was just amazed at how many there were. But then what amazed me was none of them had made it big. So a lot of the music that you're talking about, a lot of the performers you're talking about, are even to music people that are knowledgeable are unknown. We decided to find them, to find the people and find the records. We drove down through New York State, through Baltimore, into Virginia, down through the Carolinas, into Florida, up into Alabama, Mississippi, Nashville, of course, headed west, Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, wound up in California at Stanford, came back down to Nashville, and wound up a, almost a year later back in upstate New York where we were living at the time. Nobody had really taken any of this music very seriously at all. And uh, looking back, it was a whole lot of fun. <laughs> Janice Martin, the female Elvis, the girl with a golden voice, uh, Little Miss Elvis, Queen of Rockabilly, uh, Little Miss Hillbilly, uh, bitch. Janice Martin was born in rural Virginia and started playing guitar at the age of four. Her earliest memories are of her musical environment. There was a black church up the road, uh, and we would go out on a Sunday afternoon because they had church services all day long. We would go out there and hide in the weeds and listen to them. And some of the prettiest singing, I mean rollicking music. I mean, it was something happening and oh, I loved it. I mean, it was really, really good music. Janice's love of music led her into the world of talent contests, tent shows, and radio barn dances. At a very early age, she fell in with many of the most important country stars of her day. But her real passion was another kind of music altogether. In 1953, I was part of the cast of the Old Dominion Barn Dance, and we traveled from South Boston to Richmond each Saturday. And uh, I was fiddling with the radio, trying to find something I liked, and I ran up on this song, Ruth Brown's Mama, He Treats Your Daughter Me. I said, that's it. That's it. Hey, Mama. And it wasn't long after that till I told the guys when we'd go down on the Old Dominion Barn Dance, I'd say, uh, have you heard Ruth Brown? You know, do you, no, no, we don't know who Ruth Brown is. And then I would play it, you know, and pretty soon I was doing Ruth Brown's music on this all country show. At first, uh, I think people looked at me, well, this is strange, you know, this is an all country show, but they loved it. They loved it. They would just tear the place down. We had two shows a night. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have a name for it. 
It was up-tempo and it was lively and it was something happening. Rather than just getting out there, you know, and, and with a guitar and getting behind a microphone and just standing. Encouraging her musical interest at every turn was Janice's mother, Jewel. I was a very intelligent person and I've got a little of it yet. And there was something in me that I wanted to f accomplish something. And so my happiness came through the accomplishments with my daughter. I got off the school bus one day and my mama come running out the front door and uh, she said, we have got to go to Jake Owen's store and return this phone call. Chet Atkins has called and they want you to come to Nashville. So uh, that's how I met him. I went down and uh, he liked what I did. I know he, he sometimes at the session he would just he would just start laughing, you know, because this music, you know, was coming about and he was having to cut it with me, he was having to cut it with Elvis and the Jordan Airs there. I mean, he was having to do this stuff. And uh, he really liked it. Chet Atkins, a guitar virtuoso and an A&R man for RCA, was responsible for recording some of the first rockabilly performers moving to major labels. And Janice was the new addition to a roster which also included former Sun Records artist Elvis Presley. It was a puzzle that Elvis's old boss at Sun, Sam Phillips, had been unsuccessful finding a rockabilly queen for his king. But RCA was undaunted by this fact. A staff publicist quickly decided that Janice Martin had what it took to be billed as the female Elvis. They approached me and I said, no way. No, I don't want that type. I wanted to make it on my own. Uh, but they got together and they talked to Colonel Tom and to Elvis and whatever. By that time, I saw him perform. And I thought, my God, he spells his name. Five letters, E-L-V-I-S. J-A-N-I-S, we could have been twins, you know? And the parallels were just there. And as with Elvis, Janice's favor in the recording industry grew. RCA executive Steve Scholes began promoting her heavily, and Billboard magazine voted her most promising female artist of 1956. But despite her growing popularity, some sectors of American society were put off by rockabilly and by performers like Janice. I was a sweet little 15-year-old girl with an innocent face and a ponytail. But when I got on stage, I moved. I couldn't be still, so I was vulgar. These men come down here from New York and from Florida to, to find out my reasons on rock and roll music and why I preach against it. And I believe with all of my heart that it is a contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today. I 100% believe it. Why I believe that is because I know how it feels when you sing it. I know what it does to you. And I, I know uh, the evil feeling that you feel when you sing it. I know the, the, the lost position that you get into and the beat. Well, uh, if you talk to the average teenager of today and you ask them what it is about rock and roll music that they like, and they'll, the first thing they'll say is the beat, the beat, the beat. really was not outrageous by any means, but uh, my dress was different and my singing these songs, which in the, like it's a very assertive music for them. And I think I was known as kind of a rebel. The cutest thing uh, a guy <laughs> wrote about me in the press, he said she, he named all the songs I was doing, Mean Mean Man, Fujiyama Mama, Hot Dog That Made Him Mad. It said, but really, when you meet Wanda, it said she's really a sweet lady with a nasty voice. <laughs> Wanda Jackson was born in Oklahoma during the Dust Bowl years. To escape this hardship, her father, like many other Okies before him, moved the family to Bakersfield, California. It was there that young Wanda was first dazzled by that city's burgeoning music scene. And I remember seeing Rose uh, Maddox and the Maddox Brothers. Wild, wild young men like to have a good time. Wild, wild young men like to have a good time. Wild, wild boyfriends like to lose their mind. 
I was so young, I was about seven probably, and I can't remember exactly what was in my head, but I do remember thinking, oh, I've got to do that. She looked so pretty. She was, had all this sparkle stuff on and singing, and they were so energetic. I mean, that was, for those days, it was very unusual, and it just excited me. <laughs> and I said, I've got to be able to do that. And so I learned all of her songs, and she was very instrumental in my uh, career, my singing style, because I liked her feistiness. <laughs> Wanda had other musical influences as well. Her idol was Hank Thompson, who happened to hear her on a radio show in Oklahoma City and later invited her to play with him. Thompson helped Wanda get a record deal with Decca. She soon began touring in package shows with many of the male stars of the day. They always had um, just one girl, <laughs> and probably because there weren't that many girls. It, it seemed to be a man's field, and I, I never even thought about that when I entered it. You know, I just, hey, this is what I'm gonna do. <laughs> I love a mean, mean man who lives uptown. When I want him most, he's not around. He's a mean, mean man. She played guitar and she danced and she really had a, 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 a good, uh, I guess, rapport with the audience and things like that. She would talk to them and the, some of the guys, she'd kind of flirt with them a little bit and shake and things. And she really made it a show. My daddy told me, uh, you know, he was, he was never a star, but he, he did perform. He said, Wanda, if you have fun on stage, everybody else will. So I just had fun. Wanda toured the country with one of the first integrated bands of its kind, which featured the versatile Big Al Downing on piano. I was in Butte, Montana one time, and uh, I was on stage with Wanda Jackson and playing piano behind her and all of that. And the owner came up and stopped the band. And they said, uh, I said, why did you stop? The, the Bobby Poe said, well, what do you mean, stop the band? He said, well, there's a black guy playing up there with Wanda and we don't want it, not in my club, right? And so they said, uh, you can continue to play once the black guy leaves the stage. And so uh, I started to walk off the stage because I didn't want to start. Being, and Wanda said, well, Al, if you go, I'm going. And uh, the guy said, well, what, what do you mean you're going to go? We don't want you. Yeah, he said, but Al is in my band. And if, you, if he can't play here, I can't either. He had to stay on stage during the breaks. He couldn't even use the restroom. And, you know, I, I would look up there and i think, oh, Al, how do you do it? I asked myself why I did it, and then it all comes back to the music. I love to play the music. And I said, if this is the way, I, things I have to go through to play my music, uh, then I'm just gonna do it, you know? I actually do think you see change in culture before you see change in politics. And I think the Rockabilly is a perfect example of how there were uh, cultural attempts to break out of roles, how there were adoption of different roles within the culture. And that's much before we begin to articulate issues of feminism or inequality or injustice, which really doesn't come till we're impacted by the civil rights movement and then women begin to articulate their own position and their own understanding. But Betty Friedan comes after Wanda Jackson. In 1956, Wanda was asked to perform at the Grand Ole Opry, the mother church of country music. But this was both an honor and a challenge, since the Opry only occasionally invited a rockabilly performer to appear. Well, I was uh, so thrilled about being invited to the Grand Ole Opry. I'd had a country song in the top ten or something. So I designed a special dress, and it, it had a what we called a sweetheart neck. And Mother and I, when Daddy, he'd come in and he'd check the the line here. 
And then when he'd leave, Mother would say, how much you want me to take it down? I'd say, oh, about an inch. <laughs> I was so happy she got it made, and I was backstage getting ready to go on, and I was on Ernest Tubbs portion. So he came back, and uh, he looked around, and I was the only one there, had my guitar on. He said, are you Wanda Jackson? I said, yes, sir. He said, okay, you're on next. And I said, great, I'm ready. And he looked at me and he said, well, honey, you can't go on stage at the Grand Ole Opry like that. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you can't show your shoulders. I said, well, it's the only dress I have. He said, well, you'll have to cover it up. He said, you've got about two minutes. So I had worn, a, luckily, a pretty decent looking leather jacket with the long fringe you know, on the arms. That's all I could do. I was in tears. Put that old coat on, put my guitar back on, went out there and tried to sing. But, you know, I was trying to cry and sing and I was so upset. <laughs> so upset when I left. I ran out, I got Daddy. I said, we're leaving here, I'm not ever coming back. It was a problem to be a girl rockabilly singer. And uh, I, I really, I, I can honestly say, I never heard any of the comments, but the word gets back to you. And, uh, you know, I just couldn't believe it. I'm thinking, hey, you love the music, and if you like my singing, why, why can't I do this? America just wasn't ready for it. And it, it's hard to, for people today to understand how new this was. And it was like a shock. I think during the 50s especially, the mentality was that it was, it was pretty much a man's world, you know. And I think it was um, kind of risque for a girl to sing rockabilly music, to get out there and kind of move around and, you know, be maybe a little sexy and it was like... A baby, when you held me in your arms so tight You whispered that you loved me when we kissed goodnight Your kiss made the difference and then I knew Saving all my loving just for you Yeah, saving all my loving just for you Women weren't supposed to be that way. But I didn't know any better, you know, I didn't know how I was supposed to be. <laughs> so I just was the way that I wanted to be. And I did catch a lot of flack. I remember that when we went back to Oklahoma, we always started singing in church and we went back to our church and there were some whispers about, there she is, you know. You know, she sings those songs about men. Lori Collins was raised on a dairy farm in Oklahoma where the main entertainment was singing with her musically minded family. Her mother Hazel was convinced her daughter had talent and took Lori to the Cimarron Ballroom in Tulsa where she sang for Leon McAuliffe. The country star was so impressed with the young singer that he insisted she go to California to start auditioning. We'd moved to California to, for Lori basically to be a singer. But in the meantime I was in the back in the woodshed picking my guitar. I would rehearse in one room and sing and play the guitar and then Larry was in the other room and I think it drove both of my parents crazy. And uh, so finally my dad said, look, he said, why don't you two go in the bedroom and try and do this together? It would make it easier on everyone. <laughs> they dubbed themselves the Collins Kids and were almost immediately signed to appear on a weekly television show. Hi, I'm Lori Collins, and I'm meeting my brother Larry on Ranch Party. Let's all go. Come on along to the old ranch party, and we'll all have a wonderful time. Join in the song at the old ranch party. Leave all your troubles behind. On with the show now with those two little bundles of bounce in T double N T. Larry and Lori Collins. And hey, hey, uh, I mean, oh, oh. Well, I dreamed of heaven in the 
kids were a very physical act, particularly Larry. He was like a little flea jumping all over the stage. He was just hilarious, you know, and she was cute too. They were adorable. Larry and I together have some kind of chemistry. I don't know what it is. We walk on stage and all hell breaks loose. <laughs> we were pre-Elvis, you know. Elvis even, you know, called us and liked our music. He loved them, our beat. A lot of people thought that that was maybe um, too out there. You know, we should stick more to Missouri Waltz and Go Away, Don't Bother Me, these nice little country kitty songs, and we didn't want to do that. Things seemed to be heating up for the young stars. In 1955, the Collins kids signed to Columbia during the reign of Mitch Miller. Mitch Miller was the head of A&R at Columbia Records, and that meant he had his fingers in everybody's career. He's the one, you know, who, who sort of controlled the destinies of the artist. He's the one that did the sing-along with Mitch albums. Do I want you? kind of gives you an idea of where he was at musically. Um, he was very outspoken about rock and roll in the press, literally. I mean, you know, you can read quotes from the period where he's just adamantly opposed to it. And here he was with this definitive rockabilly act on his roster. You know, and I, I don't know, you know, that whether they were not made a priority or whether they were just considered to be a novelty or what, but it's clear it was not the label for them to be at. And everybody smiled when they saw us. They thought we were cute and wonderful and talented to be as young as we were, but, but maybe they just didn't take us as seriously. Another young musician who didn't feel he was taken seriously was Ricky Nelson. The teen star of his parents' TV show, The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet, Ricky strongly identified with Lori. Ricky Nelson was my uh, first love, and I mean that from my heart. We invited him over to the house, and he actually came, you know. It was like my heart, I mean, I couldn't believe it, because every girl in the world, you know, Ricky Nelson. And, and um, but, but I tried not to act gaga, you know. I tried to be mature. But I think in many ways, too, since we were both in the same business, um, after the initial shock of Ricky Nelson, that we, we really enjoyed each other's company, and we had a lot in common. Um, because he really didn't have a lot of freedom. He couldn't really be a kid. We weren't really kids. So we spent a lot of time together, um, especially playing music. Perhaps it was inevitable, but their real life relationship soon became a TV relationship. And just because your mama thinks you're hot, well, just because. Almost inadvertently, Lori and Ricky were becoming teen royalty in a culture crafted and marketed to appeal to American youth. After the advent of Elvis, you begin to see the record companies deliberately, in ever more deliberate ways, designing artists to appeal to, to those kids. And they design this whole group of Philadelphia pretty boys, and all this stuff happens, and it's very clear that it's, they're aiming it to market to young women for who these men are fantasy objects. They're sexually dis dangerous, they're rockers, and they're t Italians or whatever. They're like, you know, they're, they're different. And uh, the girls are, are the consumers. That they're, you look at the teen magazines at the time. It's very clear that, the gir that there are two assumptions. One is that girls are the consumers of teen culture, and that two, girls don't buy other girls. 
Well, you know, I remember when Elvis came out. I am that old. Uh, and I remember sitting in at, watching that Ed Sullivan show, too. And I remember, you know, how interesting and unusual it was. And I also remember at that age really looking to music um, to appreciate boys. That, again, that explains why Brenda Lee was so successful. She was not threatening. She was one of them. What's the matter? What's the matter? Why don't you call? Don't you love your little baby? No more at all. Oh, wait and here, baby. Not doing a thing. Just waiting for the dog to rain. Big love. Six to four. With Brenda Lee, you have somebody who was so titanically vocally gifted at such an incredibly young age that there that was a blank slate that was waiting to be written on. My dad died on a construction accident. Um, I was going on eight years old, I believe. And it fell upon my mom to start supporting us. At the same time, I was working and traveling with a little local band and doing some shows and also it kind of fell on me too to sort of help support the family. I don't know where my style comes from um, because I certainly didn't have anybody to emulate. I, I wasn't listening to other female singers, n not even male singers for that matter. Um, and I don't know where it came from. We didn't have record players. We couldn't afford to buy records. Basically, the only music that I heard was through the church. In time, Brenda would be able to afford records, and she would gravitate toward two rather distinct performers, Hank Williams and Mahalia Jackson. Remember one day I was walking along, they had a bit up when I saw the bus, heading on the fly, hold on. My very favorite was Mahalia Jackson, and I followed her career as much as I possibly could, and I bought all of her records, and I found her to be, um, so real and um, so powerful. It was like she was living whatever she was singing, and that really touched a chord in my being. Well, come a little baby, let's jump the broomstick. Come a let's tie a knot. Come a little baby, let's jump the broomstick. Come a let's tie a knot. Two years into her contract with the Decca label, Brenda recorded a song entitled, Let's Jump the Broomstick. It was real kind of rockabilly sounding. Uh, now I know it was rockabilly. Then I didn't know what it was. I just knew I liked the beat and, and I, I liked the song. And it was released in Europe. And it just became such a mega hit for me uh, internationally that I started touring uh, overseas. On these tours, Brenda shared the bill with a number of artists, including a little-known act called the Silver Beatles. And I thought they were just so um, irreverent and so off the wall and so really good, and they were doing their own material that they had written, that I asked them, I said, if you'll give me some kind of a tape, I'll take it back to America, to my record company, and play it for them and see, you know, I really think you all need a record deal. So they gave me a tape and they gave me a picture of how they looked. It was John, Paul, George, and Pete Best. And I took it back to Decca Records and they passed on it. They said, we don't think at this time that this sound would be popular in the States and we certainly don't think the way they look would be very popular. I was traveling over there and, and that was great. And then finally, uh, in 1959, I recorded a song called Sweet Nothings, which catapulted me um, into some success in the United States. We walk along hand in hand. Sweet Nothings sort of put me into the rock and roll field. And then with I'm Sorry and all of those, I was considered pop. And then I was considered rockabilly in, you know, in Europe. And different parts of the world, I'm considered different things. I always felt like I knew what I could sing, and I knew what I couldn't, and I knew what I could believe and what I could make believable to the public, um, which I think is an important thing. You've got to strike an emotion within somebody to, to be successful. A 15-year-old singing sensation receives the highest tribute of the world of discs as Decker 
Executive Vice President Leonard Schneider looks on. President Milton Rackmill presents to Brenda Lee a gold record, symbolizing the sale of one million copies of her song, I'm Sorry. It's the nation's number one hit, so what's for a little girl from Tennessee to be sorry about? The girl next door image was highly prized in the 50s, but not every girl could live up to that image. Tommy and I married in January the 2nd of 1956. I did not record for RCA until March the 8th of 1956. So I didn't tell the record company. I didn't tell anybody because we eloped. In Nashville, Chet Atkins presented Janice with a song to record. The irony of the number was not lost on her, but it completely escaped Atkins and the others at RCA. He said, here, let's go in here and we'll play this. And it started off, let's elope, baby, you know. Well, naturally, I kept it, I kept it a secret from the record company because uh, uh, you just didn't get married at 15 then, you know, or whatever. And they had all the teenage image going on me, the sweet little innocent, fresh-faced girl, which I was, really. Her secret was easy to keep because Tommy, a paratrooper, had been stationed overseas in Germany. But when Janice realized RCA was going to send her on a USO tour in Europe, she couldn't resist arranging a conjugal visit. The brass gave Tommy a 30-day leave, and he eagerly joined the tour. I mean, the tour manager saying, what the hell is this, you know? Who is this guy? I said, he's my husband, whatever. Oh my God. So they put in a call to New York. Oh God, they were mad. Oh, they were upset. Janice came back to the States triumphant from the tour with unintended, if not entirely unexpected results. And I came back with a little package. I was called in and uh, the suggestion was made that maybe we could do something about this little problem that I had, and uh, no way. I wouldn't do it, and I think I realized when I, I not only because the child was there, uh, I'd felt no movement or nothing, but if you ever carry a child and you have that love, I knew the consequences. And she still had obligations to the label. Eight months pregnant, Janice made one more recording for RCA. Steve Scholes was standing in the control room with my mother, and tears were pouring down his cheeks. How come? Because I had burst the whole teenage image that they had created for me. Uh, how do you promote <laughs> a 16-year-old girl, 17-year-old, you know, that is expecting a baby and whatever? Uh, Everything that they had promoted me and built me as was just destroyed. Now this, this is our first picture that we had on Town Hall Party. Huh. What's this mean? Does Ricky demand too much on his date? <laughs> <laughs> this is good. This is, well, does he? Or no, did, turn did he the page. Oh, okay. Lori and Ricky's storybook <laughs> relationship ended abruptly when she eloped with Stu Carnell, Johnny Cash's manager. To me, I think when I look back on it, it was kind of like breaking loose and, you know, getting away from, from everybody that constantly was scrutinizing me, I thought. And I married an older man. He was um, almost 16 years older than I was. So I was excited. I was happy uh, until reality set in and I realized what I had done to not only my mom and dad, but to Larry. For my parents, the world had come to an end. And for myself as well. I remember ditching class, walking down from Hollywood and Vine, uh, sitting on a back street by myself and just didn't understand the whole damn thing, you know. Was it a problem with the record company people? Yes. Because I wasn't this little innocent girl anymore. I was a married woman. It was the most difficult time in my life. And uh, when I look back on it, I. All I, you know, I would call my mom and dad, and they didn't want to talk to me. And Larry had to go out on his own and sing, and, and he was uh, bitter and had every right to be because, uh, I mean, in his mind, I just deserted him. For a time, we didn't work together. Uh, 
and the responsibility fell to me to keep, you know, the Collins family eating and the roof over our head. And uh, so it became Larry Collins going down the road with his dad. So what was really the problem? Could you not play with Larry at that time? Well, I couldn't because of the strong feeling they had against uh, my husband. Everybody hated him. Time helped, and uh, eventually the family grew. Our career changed, definitely, you know. Um, we were really no longer recording. Uh, we kind of got involved in Las Vegas. Um, and work there 22, 23 weeks a year. Um, then, uh, of course, Reno and Lake Tahoe. There wasn't a lot of TV shows, and, you know, we'd grown up, gotten older, and so it, it just changed our whole career, I think. And I really, truly attribute a lot of it to my marriage. While the Collins kids struggled to return to the music scene together, Rockabilly had met an untimely end. Clearly, the record industry was changing as the marketing of music to teens became more institutionalized. And when Brenda Lee's friends the Beatles arrived, all bets were off for American music for quite some time to come. I was being played, you know, in several different fields and selling in all those fields. And that was great. But then I think with the evolution of the business and all the big bucks that came into being, and uh, management strategy at the labels and marketing strategies uh, where they marketed you. Um, you had to either be in this field or that field. And, and at that point, because I had been just not really required to be in any field, I had been in so many, I was neither fish nor fowl. So that, that really hurt me in a lot of ways, recording-wise. Some of the rockabilly people retreated to the familiarity of Nashville and the country music scene. Wanda Jackson did this for a time, but she eventually found her priorities shifting. In 1971, she became a Christian. And so that became so premier in my thinking that I've got to tell people what's happened to me because it was so wonderful. So the best way I could do it was through music. For about 10 years, I concentrated on recording. In fact, I even got a release from Capitol Records so that I could pursue the gospel recording company. But uh, all my fans thought I had died, I guess. You know, my country music, my rockabilly fans thought, you know, what's happened to Wanda? We don't see her anymore. Janice Martin was also living out of the limelight. She and Tommy divorced in 1960, and for a brief time after, she recorded for a smaller label and toured. But when she married a second time, her new husband demanded she stay at home. I stood it till 1967, and uh, I wanted the music back so bad. Then I realized it wasn't Mama, it wasn't anybody but me that wanted this thing. It was like part of me was missing. It was like I didn't have arms and legs. I didn't know what to do with myself. Okay, I'd had enough of being a little housewife. You used to be ashamed to admit something like this, but uh, I had a total nervous breakdown in 1967 and did not know why, you know, I was in this situation. But with the therapy and the analysis I got and everything, it was this music way down deep in me that did not have an outlet. Janice convinced her husband to let her form a band again, but it wasn't long before his old feelings about her career resurfaced. 1973, he gave me the ultimatum again. This band is interfering with our marriage. Uh, we're going to give the band up. Uh, this is it. And I looked at him, and by this time, 13 years had passed, and I said, well, you gave me that ultimatum before. And I chose you. I said, this time I'm choosing the music. The years passed and many of these artists felt forgotten. Personal decisions, societal pressures, changes in the industry, and shifts in musical taste seemed to cheat them of their place in rock and roll history. 
But then, an interesting revival occurred. I might not have been as hot as some of the artists out there, um, but you know, I, I had certainly had my days in the sun and I had been number one, and you can't always be number one, that's why there are numbers underneath it. So I had been there, done that, and was grateful for that, and certainly was grateful to even still be in the business that I loved. First in Europe and then in the U.S., the Rockabillies were being asked to perform again. I went in to see Chet Atkins in 1978, and uh, I told him, Chet, I want it back. I want it back. And he says, honey, the business is so different than it was when you were in it. And, you know, you had your mother to protect you and whatever. And he says, but you don't know about what's happening for you in Europe? Larry and I really didn't have any idea how popular our music was over there, but promoters kept calling. I hadn't done any secular music, you know, in 10 years, and I... My husband and I, you know, we, we said, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and see if he, he'll explain to us what's going on. You know, I've basically been a writer for years and, and, uh, and a, uh, uh, an amateur golfer. And to get me to walk away from that golf course, you really got to do some talking. God has his ways of letting you know his will. And we realized that he was going to use my music popularity in the foreign countries as a vehicle for my testimony. So finally in 1982, I got up my nerve. Uh, Rock House Records contacted me and wanted me to come over and it was my birthday, my 42nd birthday. Uh, and I went over and oh, it was fabulous. So we flew over there and uh, it was just incredible. Now that has been a pretty hot set, but maybe you can give it some one more time to come back out. If you're really sold out to God to say, use me, a vehicle, a, a voice for you, then he says, great. And you're, you're doing things you never dreamed you'd do. The trouble all started up in cell block number four. Red like fire across the prison floor. A walk came in with a big Tommy gun. Bang, bang, bang. I'm going back into places that I thought I would never go back into again. But it's because the people are wonderful, like the Rockabilly set we were talking about. They're hungry to see some originals that, you know, they've got my old records, and I have a great time with them, and I can say, hey, you know what happened to me in 1971? I became a Christian, and life has been great ever since. And I don't bore them, and I don't preach. I just tell them that, and that seems to be all God wants me to do right now. Now, next year, he may change me again, but I'm open to it. I was considered a rebel because I sung barefoot on the stage. That's how innocent things were in the 50s. I would be singing and I'd kick my shoes off and everybody go, oh, you know, oh my God, you know. <laughs> the music back in the 50s, you would have to maybe do 18 takes because every word you had said had to be distinct. There couldn't be any hisses in it at all. And the modern day music, my God, you can't understand a word they're saying, it's distortion. That's why I am thrilled that the rockabilly scene is coming back in the States. I 
I'm Marty Brom, and I'm a singer. And I'm here this weekend for the Rockabilly, the Viva Las Vegas weekend. What is it about the 50s and the way that fits into the Rockabilly music that interests you? And it just seems a lot more relaxed and wholesome. It was a sweet time, you know. It was a loving time. And I think these young people, they want to feel that feeling. There was things that were kind of stifling to, to, to you know, people, to women. and um, But on the other hand, there was, you know, people had families and that was valued. The 50s were a time of dancing and just having a good old time, not worrying about anything. Women have had a hard time making it in the music industry since day one, and rockabilly was no exception. Though today, it's glad I'm glad to see that there's more rockabilly women coming out in their own bands. Kim Lenz and her Jaguars, excellent band. Josie Cruiser, as well as the old standbys who paved the way for the rest of us. For women in rockabilly to meet other women in rockabilly is greater than any guy <laughs> in rockabilly. There's tons of them, you know, and they meet their they meet their uh, they're heroes and it's wonderful, but when a woman meets a, a woman hero of rockabilly, it's really something special. Yeah, yeah, it's it's Kim Lanz and her Jaguars. Ah, it's a female led rockabilly band and yeah. I get compared to you a lot. Well, I hope yeah. that's yeah. that. Which I'm always, you know, that, that's a big compliment. <laughs> when it's working with us. Yeah, Okay, are you are you ready? Yeah, I think so. Shall we, shall we do what we used to do in the 50s for luck? Yep. <laughs> Go get him, sister. Go get him, bub. Okay. Direct from Ranch Party to Viva Las Vegas here tonight, Rockabilly legends Larry and Lori, the Collins kids now. Let's bring them on now. Let's hear it now. I used to make a joke uh, after Tom Ingram contacted me and wanted me to do Viva Las Vegas. I went in and looked at myself in the mirror one morning, and I said, Hey, old gal, I said, it took you 59 years, but you're going to Vegas. <laughs> you know. And uh, I was kind of nervous about it, but when they come and got me and I walked down that back hallway, they were all crowded around the stage as far as I could see. And when they saw me, even though I was 59 years old, and they'd seen the little 15, 16 year old, they knew who I was. And when I come through there and went up the steps and walked out on the stage and they just roared, I said, my God, there's nothing like this. I mean, you know, I'd give up anything for this. They said that she was the female Elvis. No, no. Elvis was the female Janice. Look, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Janice Martin, let's hear it now. Rock, rock, couples 
If these people waited all these years, then what are you afraid of? I mean, you go out there and it's, it's the fans. They're there. I hate to fly. I absolutely am horrified. I don't even want to go to the restrooms on a plane. But the reason I go is because I know they're over there and they're waiting to see me. And I haven't, you know, when I go next year, uh, the first of next year, I haven't been to Europe since 1994. It's time. It's time. To learn more about rockabilly women, log on to itvs.org. Major funding for Welcome to the Club was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding was provided by the Pacific Pioneer Fund, the Wellspring Foundation, Artists Trust, and by the following donors. A complete list is available from ITVS.